So greetings everyone and welcome to the Rebus Open Textbook Network Office Hour session for this month. Today we're going to be talking about OER workflows and we are very excited to have several guests with firsthand experience in uh, making OERs and open textbooks. Um, I will go ahead and introduce everyone uh, preceding their few minutes to talk about their processes and uh, we will have time at the end for questions and please make use of chat as well as we go. Um, the Open Textbook Network, just briefly, is an alliance of institutions uh, in higher education that are working to advance the use of open textbooks, which includes both adoption and creation. And I'll just turn it over to Hugh to introduce Rebus and then we'll get started. Great, thanks. Thanks, Karen. So, um, for those of you who don't know Rebus, we are trying to de develop um, a set of uh, transparent processes for creating open textbooks, a set of tools to support those processes, and to imbue all of that with a notion of collaboration across, uh, within institutions, across institutions, and really across the world, ultimately. Um, so we're currently working on 12, um, let's say pilot projects as we're trying to work out both um, how we think this ought to work with the input of the people we're working with and to develop some tools to, to make that happen. So we're really excited about this particular topic. It's something near and dear to our heart. And what we wanted to do here was get feedback from people who've been doing this for a while in different kinds of ways. Um, our desire is to try to get help this community broadly with the you know, if the learnings in one place to try to incorporate them uh, in, in ways that can help other people uh, do various things, including um, create open textbooks. Um, I should also say we're a, a nonprofit uh, based out of Canada. We have funding from Hewlett Foundation to do this work, um, and we've been partnering with the OTN for a few months now doing these office hours as part of this effort to try to get the community talking together about what best practices can be. Um, so I think that's it for me, um, and I think I will again just say the the work around open textbooks. I think are really critical that we think about them in the right way as a community, and we've got a bunch of people who've got a lot of experience um, of different kinds in creating open textbooks and OER, and very excited to hear what they have to say about what what they've learned in their processes. So over to uh, Karen to manage the, the roster and, and clock, etc. Thanks, Hugh. So before we get started, I will mention that the Open Textbook Network, together with Rebus, has produced two guides recently. There's the Open Editing Guide for editing open textbooks and also recently the Open Authoring Guide. So I'll put those links in the chat as we go along. So to kick us off, I am happy to introduce Billy Meinke. He's at the University of Hawaii, which happens to be an Open Textbook Network member. Billy, I would like to turn it over to you to talk about your process. All right, um, good morning or afternoon or evening to you, depending where you are. It's nine o'clock in the morning here in Hawaii. Um, I'm Billy Meinke, I'm the OER technologist for the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, the UHM campus is one of 10 campuses within the UH uh, system. And basically, um, myself um, and a network of folks throughout the system are trying to figure out how to get OER off the ground here, um, not just with off-the-shelf OER adoptions, but also with producing our own content. Um, so I feel really lucky to be in this position, um, also to be working you know, with Rebus and with the OTN, kind of figuring out how this stuff works, because I really think that um, part of the power of open, open source, open content is that people, individual people can create their own content. Um, and it really, it gives a lot of power to individuals. Um, so um, part of my background was in instructional design um, and web development. Uh, so I have some experience with project management on that end. And what I wanted to do was sort of give a high level uh, view of what actually goes into adopting an OER and adapting it or creating a brand new one. Um, and so some of you may have seen, uh, there was a blog post I put out a couple months ago, sort of uh, sharing uh, a workflow that I developed. I'm gonna drop a link into the chat. And basically, um, these are my notes, uh, sort of neatly, uh, neatly tuned, neatly uh, gone over. Um, to basically produce a workflow diagram. So if any of you um, actually go to the blog post there, you can go to the Google Doc and print it off. It prints nicely onto 11 by 17. And basically this is 
these are the, the major steps in producing an OER, um, at least in my experience. Basically, the priming phase, making sure the people that are on the project are actually, um, they know about Creative Commons and open licensing. Um, they have an idea about instructional design and like sort of the, the nitty gritty of it. Um, moving into pre-production, getting the project ready to go, um, design phase, sort of uh, figuring out what the, the look and feel will be like, and then moving into actually the development phase, phase with actually uh, creating content and uh, adapting existing content, all the way into the publishing phase where we are going to be using press books like many OTN uh, folks are to produce our OER. Um, press books is awesome. I'm sure most of you know this. Um, it exports to lots and lots of formats, uh, which was the the key thing that drove me to it initially, but also the fact that it's an open source project that's kind of like, whoa, okay, I need to figure out what these folks are doing. Um, so I'm heavily promoting Pressbooks uh, within our system, and uh, we are actually now incorporating Pressbooks training into our general OER training at all the campuses. So it's a, it's a slow process, um, but again, the Rebus uh, project and OTN have really uh, sort of given us a foundation to begin figuring out how these workflows and processes work so individual faculty and staff can take advantage of them. So in the interest of kind of keeping it short so everybody has enough time to speak, I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you, Billy, and thank you for that uh, workflow diagram. I know that it's uh, really helpful for a lot of us. So I would now like to introduce Rebel Cummings Sells, who's at Kansas State University, also an OTN member. Rebel, please take it away. Hello, everybody. Um, today, I just wanted to first start by introducing myself. I'm Rebel Cummings Sells at Kansas State University, and I'm the director for the Center for Advancement of Digital Scholarship. And here we cover uh, copyright data and open access. So that gives us a unique um, fit with our publishing press to um, doing open access publishing. So um, the uh, initiative at Kansas State University actually started in um, 2012, 2013, um, and has been going pretty strong since. They've produced over 75 um, awards for open and alternative textbooks. And so not all of our resources are um, quite yet an open textbook that are out there, but we are moving um, even some of our alternative resources in that direction. So for us, our processes and timelines um, can for producing these textbooks can be very flexible um, and open. So um, we would like to see resources added to the course within one year of the award approval, um, but by the time that they actually become open and into our press, um, sometimes it can take longer than that, um, and it vary, and sometimes it can be shorter than that. It just varies with each project. Um, so for us, um, we do grant distributions with our applications for our open access and open alternative textbooks, and so paying the faculty sometimes um, can be actually a difficult part of the workflow step to get things started. Um, we often find that even those that are gung-ho to go straight open um, require some additional um, curation and um, use of their book or their textbook before they actually want to publish it and make it, it open access. Um, also, we're to the point that um, we're asking ourselves, what do we do after we've gathered all the low hanging fruit or you know the easy to reach fruit um, so um, that's one of the pain points um, in our workflows is getting new textbooks into that workflow um, how could the process be made more efficient with us as with any other resources um, more resources could be thrown at producing open textbooks so um, we often find that they want it easy to use in the comfort of their location, easy to compile in one place, and as Billy mentioned, produce multiple output files or formats. Um, <clears throat> for us, working with each project is different. As I said before, um, it varies with each faculty member, and we actually like that flexibility, and so do our faculty members. So um, some projects, we actually, in our center, all together, we don't do anything at all on the whole project, um, and it gets pretty much push, pushed out to a full open textbook. But it, in others, we're more involved. Um, we're doing beyond the ISBN and the reviews of the textbook, but cover design and formatting and 
some tracking down content and applying the license and different things like that. So, um, and for us, uh, tracking the process is pretty easy. Um, we just wait and watch for final payments to be made out for our awards. Um, and withholding funding for us seems to be a good motivator for success. So on to the next. I appreciate all the smiles on uh, withholding funding as a key motivator. Um, thank you, Rebel. Uh, we all really appreciate you sharing your experience at Kansas State. So next up, we have Anthony Palmetto from OpenStax. Anthony, thank you for joining us again at Office Hours. We look forward to uh, hearing about your process. Great. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm from OpenStax, and uh, I'm the editorial director there. And um, OpenStax is mostly creating uh, full-on textbooks, um, often from scratch, sometimes repurposed from existing books. Um, we, um, as a starting point, you know, basically seek and then are awarded funding along those lines. And uh, we, mo most of the books we're developing are um, meant to be uh, competitive with the market leading texts um, in, in each course and to also, um, I guess, uh, you know, well, match the scope and sequence of the typical course and be easily adoptable by, by faculty, you know, uh, nation, nationwide and, and, and beyond. Um, so our, our process generally involves a good degree of initial uh, preparation. Um, it, uh, market research, competitive benchmarking, um, understanding the issues in the course, that's sort of the first thing we're doing, uh, deciding if it's a place where we're gonna, you know, do anything different from, from what is mainstream, um, um, take advantage of any education research or other uh, new ways of teaching and so on, um, and also, you know, understanding the length, uh, you know, requirements, um, are different artistic, mathematical, and other requirements for each book. Um, in that, we, we get that information, uh, the, one of the biggest steps is involving a number of faculty, um, and we are sending out surveys and doing interviews, attending conferences, and so on, and, and involving as many faculty as we could to get that benchmarking and that market research done. And then hopefully those same faculty uh, from, from colleges and universities around, uh, around North America and beyond will um, you know, be a part of the process as well. That's, a, that's ideal. Um, once we establish the basic outline, the approach, we build the team. And again, you know, it's, it's almost all uh, college level faculty. Um, and they're also, uh, you know, have an interest in, in doing this, but we, you know, they, they do get paid. Um, so that is a motivator for us as well. And it, and it needs to be, um, because we, we want to make sure they're, they're, you know, doing, doing solid work. And, um, we, most of our books take anywhere between about 18 months and two years. And most of these faculty members, you know, they have other things going on, uh, uh part of their, their research or their teaching and, and their general lives and so on. Um, the writing process uh, is, is undertaken and then an intensive review process from the same faculty members, um, other, you know, others that are, that are involved will um, inform the feed, you know, give us feedback, have us uh, revise a textbook, put it through development editing and so on. Originality checking is very important for us. Uh, we make sure that, you know, um, inadvertently or on purpose, you know, we're not seeing anything lifted from somewhere else without permission or inappropriately used. Um, educating a lot of faculty about fair use guidelines, most of which is, is that, you know, it, they can't just use anything and, and so on. Um, also, art rendering and accessibility uh, is very important for our process. We have to make sure that everything is as accessible as possible. We, we continually go through um, revisions and efforts both on our software platform, but also within the, the uh, writing itself. Um, so, you know, not, don't use color to delineate uh, context, you know, al alternative text for uh, every piece of uh, art, use MathML for uh, mathematics so that a text a screen reader can, can grab it, uh, can read it. Um, we put it through accuracy checking and revision as much as possible, rinse, you know, rinse and repeat as much as we need, and then go into an XML production. Um, our, our material is hosted on our own site, but it can be ported over into a lot of different um, environments, which it is, and we're, we're very happy to see that um, the licensing is uh, in every case except for one CC by. Um, so we, we do that, and then we get into uh, you know, a marketing and, and uh, promotional process. That's basic our workflow, um, and uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Anthony. So um, Diana Fisher is unable to join us today as planned, but she was a contributor to the Open Authoring Guide where she shared her workflow. So I'm just going to put 
um, a link to the guide and what she contributed um, uh, for that. And then I'm going to introduce Allison Brown. She is our last uh, member in today's conversation to introduce the process um, that they've used at Open SUNY. And then we're going to have lots of time for questions and open conversation because everybody has been uh, totally on the dot and keeping it short and sweet. So um, everyone out there, please think of your questions and um, I'll turn it over to Allison to learn about what they're doing uh, in New York. Thanks, Karen. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Allison Brown. Um, I work with the Open SUNY textbooks, um, and we have um, in the past been um, publishing textbooks. Um, we have 18 so far, so my, um, my experience has been um, coordinating the production process for those books. Um, and so the, um, the workflow that, that we put our books through um, after we've gotten the manuscript is um, putting them through peer review, um, walking the author through some revision, um, providing copy editing, um, proofreading, and then the, um, the final, or the production, pro or the format, the typesetting process, and then the proofreading, um, and then the publication process. Um, and, and so um, just to answer some of those um, prompting questions that we came into this conversation with, um, talking about some of those pain points. Um, for me, any of the transitions um, where you're moving the manuscript from either one person to another or one platform to another um, is going to be a big pain point. Um, so. Um, in copy editing, one of the things that we found to be a pain point is um, walking the author through what we need from them um, after copy editing. Um, and so one thing that we do is kind of screen those copy edits um, before we send the manuscript back to the author to make sure that they're concentrating on um, approving stylistic or content-oriented edits rather than um, reviewing um, tracked changes for added commas and things like that. Um, the other thing that um, I have found to be a good um, a good solution to some of these pain points is um, spending some time on um, prepping and doing some um, really thorough needs assessments on your manuscripts. So on the technical side, really looking at um, what your going to need from the author, especially in terms of media, in terms of permissions, um, and then on the editorial side and um, making decisions um, up front about how um, in depth you're going to need your copy editing done, um, getting some of the details in place and lists in place right up front about style guides um, and um, kind of what format you're going to have that manuscript in and how you're going to have those copy editors work um, is really helpful. Um, having that done up front. Um, and when I look at our workflow and the um, what is our common line of success through our different books that we've um, worked on, it um, really comes down to the author in a lot of ways and um, facilitating a healthy communication with the author. Um, and so making sure that um, you are as upfront as possible with your author about what you're gonna need from them in any given stage of the um, publication process um, is really important. And um, just making sure you have the author engaged in every step of the way and, um, and understanding their other competing interests so that you can plan around what they might need to do. I mean, I see my production workflow um, change drastically from the summer um, to during the semester. Um, so just keeping that in mind and how you're timing your, um, your projects is um, helpful. Um, as far as how we keep everyone updated and our staff um, moving forward, um, I've used simple project tools just like spreadsheets. Um, I have used Basecamp in the past. Um, which was helpful when I had multiple projects at once, but um, nothing really beats a simple whiteboard with um, checklists that everyone can see um, and that you can just be looking at every single day um, to keep you on track. Um, um, so my 
general takeaway is that the um, the role of the project manager is really um, important and I think um, having that project manager be outside um, each of the specific steps um, within the process um, is also helpful so that they can be the person that says um, you know has this goal been met is this ready to move on to the next stage um, So that's all I got. Thank you, Allison. So one thing that occurs to me listening to everyone give their short and sweet um, workflow synopsis is that it sounds so short and sweet, so easy breezy. <laughs> um, and I know that that is not always the case. So I would like to invite anyone who is in on office hours to please um, let us know if you have questions or put something in the chat. But maybe while you're thinking of your questions, I'll go ahead and start with that. Like, as you, as you uh, gave an overview of your workflow, what are some of the sticking points? Um, things that sound like um, they're easy or perhaps you underestimated in early days that um, actually require a lot of attention. Um, this is Rebel on K-State. <clears throat> One of the things that is actually probably the most time consuming for us sometimes is the after part, after they think they've gotten it ready. Um, for us, they, we use it a lot in the classroom before we actually publish it. So um, for the most part, one semester is enough, but um, I think that surprises them sometimes that there's like after work, after they think they're done, they're like, whoo, I'm done. I, I have it all ready and I've given it to the press and then they're like, oh no, there's still more. Do, um, Rebel, this is Hugh here. Um, do you, what is sort of your mechanism for managing that process? I, I think the, to, to me, this is one of the values of open textbooks is you can kind of think of this idea of, of having an early publication with mechanisms to get feedback on it, but I'm just wondering how you manage that process with your, with your authors and, and who are involved in, in the process, if you go into a bit more detail there. Um, yeah, actually, most of the faculty members handle it, and they've handled it in a couple of different ways. Um, one of them has added it specifically on their TVAL. So at the end of the semesters, the students give like an evaluation. So after they use that resource in the semester, um, they've asked the students how specifically, how did you like the resource and give me feedback about the resource. Um, others have asked almost like, like a quiz about the, or, you know, or survey to the students about the resource, and they had specific questions about the resource. Um, one had an online form where they allowed students at any time throughout the semester to anonymous, anonymously go to this form and submit con comments about the content content that what they were using and um, if they found errors or if there were questions about how it was received distributed in the class or the way that it was flowing anything they could submit comments about it um, another offered bonus points to um, their students they capped it at 10 points uh, per student um, and they he said he gave out a lot of points the first semester but um, since then he's only given out you know very few this last year he only gave out one point so it's a way to continually um, kind of keep it in check to does it still meet the students needs there's a, a question for Anthony from Christina uh, and there's one from Jody as well but I'll, I'll ask the one to Anthony um, uh, how do you do the checks for originality? What, what's your process for checking that uh, someone isn't plagiarizing? Sure, that's that's a great question. Um, also, I saw that somebody asked if um, if the workflow, our workflow, is written down. I don't know that it is. Um, I I can definitely get it down in an OpenStax blog post or something like that, but I don't know if it's down now. Um, originality. Um, we check it in two ways. We we work with editorial, uh, you know, freelance editorial vendors, and they um, they they put it in you know, proposals to take part in the projects. 
and they have teams of you know full on development editors, most of the same ones you know sort of just do the the regular publisher textbooks, and they oversee a process where each piece of manuscript is put through originality checking using a uh, a software such as Authenticate, which will do an automatic check of everything you know that you, it can find on the web based on that text. Uh, so it's kind of like turn it in if you're familiar with that or it's basically for this purpose just checking for plagiarism we also do a spot check beyond that um and basically for you know usually about one section per chapter at some point in the process we'll do a quick review regarding um you know uh, an editorial uh, an editor reading it um putting some of the phrasing especially technical phrasing things that we think might be right for uh somebody reusing from somewhere else and maybe not uh, giving proper credit um, in almost every case. And so, so that's a Google spot check. Usually one of those two methods catches some things in almost every case, it's completely unintentional. Uh, and the, it's down to, um, you know, maybe the material was actually um, published openly somewhere. And, um, but that original, that person who posted it openly didn't have the right to do so. So, you know, the, the author or contributor at that point didn't really know that they did anything wrong, but um, you know, through this, through this method, we, we catch it. And then, most of the time we just have to attribute it um, in many cases. And in some cases we have to do something else, uh, you know, rewrite it and so on, depending on what the, what the issues are. Awesome. Uh, th there's a question here from Jody. Um, how do you handle copy editing and layout? Is it freelanced out or done in house? I'm going to point one at um, Allison, because I know they've got some interesting approach to that. Um, and if anyone else, Else wants to jump in as well go, go ahead but um, Allison maybe you could explain how your uh, copy editing proofreading and, and layout processes work sure sure um, so we do both <laughs> um, sometimes we contract out with professional copy editors um, and sometimes we rely on um, volunteer copy editors so it depends on the timing it depends on the needs of the particular manuscript if it's a very um, technical manuscript or if it just needs the attention of a um, professional copy editor then we um, we go that route, um, and then if um, we later copy editing, then we rely on a, um, a very a good group of um, volunteer copy editors, both from within the SUNY system and just volunteers from all over the world. Um, and both of those have, I've experienced the same amount of time as a manager in terms of communicating with the people that are doing the work. So even when you're working with a um, professional copy editor, you are putting time into making sure that they understand the needs of the manuscript and then being that pass through between them and the author. Um, and I've found that it's about the same amount of time as um, wrangling volunteers. Um, and then for production and typesetting, we do that in-house. So I have some student workers that I've trained um, both in InDesign and also Pressbooks um, to do the, um, the import and the formatting and all of that fun stuff. Yeah, there's a note here. Actually, uh, Rebel, why don't you um, uh, jump in there in audio so we can catch your answer. Um, I was just saying for for us text for our textbooks faculties can use their awards that we give them towards copy editing they can also as allison said find a volunteer copy editor that's actually what a lot of them do um, we will do a light copy editing before we actually publish it we don't want to produce anything that's um you know obvious and then um we also do formatting in-house and then we require um an internal external review which we hope We'll catch some of that for us as well. Awesome. Um, so th there's a question higher up here, um, which I suspect there's no such thing as a typical project, but get, um, question from R. Saunders. Uh, can someone give an idea of how long a typical project in, from manuscript to publication release? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to take that. And maybe, I know, so, Anthony, you said it was 18 months to two years was roughly your from from project conception to, to Yeah, that, that's from about from project conception So, you know manuscript comes in on a rolling basis probably over about four or five months and then that's put into the copy edit the review um, Revision copy editing production process and that could take another 
you know, depending on the size of the book, could take another six months to to almost a year um, in, in that case. So especially if we're doing a book that's, you know, two semester long book, like a principles of uh, econ or something like that. Um, but that's, yeah, so, so I would say about six months to a year for, for us. But again, it's a bit rolling. And uh, Allison or um, Rebel, do you guys have similar timelines? Yeah, I would say a minimum of a year. I think it's the fastest that I've seen any of them done. Um, but I would, I would say 18 to 24 months is a good kind of ballpark figure. Right. Yeah, I'll third that timeline. But it varies hugely between the projects because, I mean, I've had projects happen in a year, but then some are pushing four. <laughs> Yeah, I'll jump in. I also think that, um, so if you look at it in terms of two different buckets, one bucket being reusing existing content versus publishing something new, the timelines can vary, you know, greatly. So in our case, we have a food science human nutrition book um, that we actually were borrowing from OpenStax uh, Anatomy and Physiology. So thank you, Anthony. Um, and also from one of the flat world knowledge books. So most of our main chapters came from two books that had already been peer reviewed and sort of gone through in the, you know, broad stroke, broad stroke sort of way. Um, but now we're now that the manuscript is more or less complete. Now we're entering the copy editing review phase, and we're finding out that you know the the tone and the writing wasn't quite the same. So we're having to fix little details there. Um, but when you're starting with existing resources, um, you can really sort of shrink down the, the initial ramp up time to get your project to a good spot. Okay, I see a few other questions here. Um, there was one comment from uh, Michael. Shiflet at Ohio State that roughly um, nine months, once the manuscript gets 70-80% complete, it's usually still another nine months before sort of official publication happens. Um, there's a question here, sorry that disappeared, so a question here from Danielle, um, and I'm going to throw this one to Billy, uh, but anyone else can take it on, but um, do you have a contract that makes it very clear that the CCBY, oh actually maybe this is for someone specific but ccby license allows for an author's work to be modified so the question there is about understanding about what the implications are of ccby licenses um so maybe billy if you want to handle that or if someone else wants to talk about the the not just the license that that you choose but the implications and how aware the authors are of what what those things might mean in the future Sure. Yeah, I think any OER project sort of starts with your potential authors or contributors understanding copyright as it sits and the importance of Creative Commons licenses, um, not only in terms of how they can reuse others' work, um, others' works, but also how, you know, how it affects things that they publish. Um, but generally, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty easy sell, especially when you need to get into a contract to show them all the good OER that's already been produced and say, you know, we can add your work to this pool of good stuff. Um, but if we're going to be giving you this grant money or funding to get the project done, it needs to be done openly and the final product is published with this license. It's more or less how the conversation goes. Um, there are often little questions around licensing and details, um, but they're, you know, they're, they're nothing that can't be worked through. Awesome. So the uh, questions are starting to come in pretty fast and furious now. So um, I get it. There's another follow-up question interesting from Danielle here about um, the testing in classrooms or the, the early sort of reviewing that's happening in classrooms and, and how that impacts on ongoing editing. Maybe I'll, I'll throw that back to Rebel who mentioned that specifically, if you could address sort of how that is and how annoyed the, the authors maybe get if they realize they have to re, you know, rework the classroom feedback. Um, I think they actually appreciate it. The faculty appreciate it and the students appreciate it. So the we typically let them know that the first semester they're going to receive the most feedback um, from their students and that's going to require the most um, revision after the first semester. After that it's about five percent or less each semester is what we've been told um, and it'll trail down even longer more than that as the years you know and then it'll just kind of be keeping it up to date. Um, at that point. Awesome. Um, he, here's a question from Claudia, um, which is one near and dear to my heart. 
maybe I'll give a quick answer to, to it uh, and then open it up to the rest of you. But if a faculty member wants to collaborate with others, um, groups already working on where to go or groups already working on that book, can they join? Um, so that's sort of a general question about collaboration. And uh, the reason that's near and dear to my heart is a lot of the efforts we're trying to put into in developing methodologies at Rebus are around trying to make this work, uh, make it easier for people to collaborate on projects rather than seven different um, biology uh, books starting up independently at different um, campuses. So we're working with uh, various institutions and faculty helping to develop um, open textbooks, but with the notion that these should be done in a transparent way with uh, in encouraging collaboration. It doesn't mean that every piece of the process needs to be uh, open for anyone to collaborate on, but but that we're trying to build that into the into this kind of workflow of how we're approaching open textbooks. But I'll let um, some of the others, if anyone wants to jump in there about collaboration, um, if you're if you've got a faculty member who wants to work on something but uh, would prefer to be collaborating with someone else, what what sort of approaches do you take with that? Yeah, I, I think it's hard to get folks to uh, collaborate with you to work on something unless there's at least yourself or one person is like gung ho. We're going to do this. Like it's going to happen with or without you, right? There has to be somebody driving the project. Um, and so kind of like you were saying, Hugh, um, sort of documenting and sharing openly as you go, okay, now here's where we are, here's the work we did, and here are the things that need to be done. Communicating that effectively um, is, is really crucial in terms of getting uh, really good contributions from volunteers, and that's a process we're still trying to work out ourselves. Because um, like I said, we have uh, one of the books, um, the manuscript is more or less complete, kind of 70, 80%, like I was saying before. Um, but getting volunteers to actively uh, give us, you know, uh, copy editing feedback, any kind of content feedback, um, it's been kind of tricky. And so that's, that's why we're here talking about this, right? Yeah, and again, that, that's really the, our mission in life is to try to figure out really fundamentally that piece. How do we make it so that someone in Arkansas can say, hey, I need copy editing help on this geography textbook, and that someone in Hawaii might say, you know, might be informed of that, who's interested, and get the notification and, and come over and help it out. So that's, we're really trying to work on, on that piece of things at Rebus. Um, so I'm happy for that question there. Um, so a question here from Jody again, uh, who I think is, must be right in the in the guts of, of the actual production process somewhere, but how do you handle graphic design um, for covers, for interior figures, for document design, etc.? So how are people going about uh, that piece of it? Um, I'd throw that over to OpenStax in a minute, but maybe someone else can take before Anthony talks about what OpenStax does, which is probably slightly different than some of the other projects. And um, maybe, uh, yeah, go ahead, whoever that is. Oh, it's Allison. Um, I was just gonna say our covers, we, um, for our original books in our series, we just designed in-house. Um, but with our new um, initiative, SUNY OER Services, and when working with some of the campuses that are doing adoption processes, um, adoption projects, um, they're having some cool ideas with engaging students to do some of the graphic design for the covers that are being of the OER that will be adopted um, at their school, um, which I think is a really cool model. Um, yay, students, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a question from Robin asking to Allison, what kind of formats are the manuscripts coming in? Is it Word? Um, and then how from manuscript to press books or wherever it's going? Um, is it chapter by chapter in your manuscript? Um, and then a sub question about how do you do peer review, but maybe take the, the format and sort of that, that raw uh, <laughs> for the format of manuscripts first. Um, yeah, so we usually um, let our authors choose um, to a point. <laughs> um, we do want them to work in a, um, in a format that they are comfortable in because it's such a big project. Um, but obviously we are constrained in some ways. So um, 
I mean, I take anything from Word documents to open documents to Google Docs. Um, and then for our math, um, we do work with latex. Um, and then um, the Word documents and open documents and Google documents import um, pretty easily into Pressbooks. Um, and I do, in order to like kind of officially move um, the project from into production, I do require that we have the full manuscript because I have examples of projects where we were kind of starting to move forward while we waited for the end chapters and then they maybe never came in. So um, I would I would recommend waiting for the full um, manuscript before you put like time investment into um, doing the production work. Did I hit all of the answers there? I think so. Yeah, then there was another question about peer review. Um, so it was for you, Allison, as well. And then I might um, add a follow up on that as well. And maybe Karen can talk about the review process at OTN, actually. Yeah. But go ahead, Allison. Sure. So for our textbooks, we engaged ex um, like, I was going to say exterior, is that the right word? Um, outside reviewers to review the manuscript. Um, our first round of proposals, we had one peer reviewer that read the manuscript and worked with the author. Um, and again, we kind of left um, how some of how that happened um, between up to the reviewer and the author. Or sometimes um, they knew each other and wanted to kind of co-collaborate and work on that together and kind of have an open peer review throughout um, the process. Um, some of them wanted a more formal um, peer review process where they just did a write-up and provided that to the author. Um, but we did provide them with guidelines and a rubric that they could use if they wanted to. Um, and then we um, started having two reviewers our next um, our next round to provide a, a couple more, some more um, feedback to our authors. So we're thinking about peer review a lot, um, especially as we're thinking about different publishing models to support. Currently, the Open Textbook Library and Open Textbook Network have a model for post-production peer review, so after the book has been published. And about 60% of the open textbooks in the library have been peer reviewed by faculty who are experts in that particular subject area. And they do that as part of becoming members of the open textbook network. There are facilitated workshops in which faculty are introduced to the library, they look for a book in their area, and then using a rubric that we adapted from BC campus, they go through and do um, a fairly light review, um, which you can see. Uh, when you go into the open textbook library, but in terms of during the production process um, We've been having a lot of conversations about that, which I think Hugh um, Probably wants to talk a bit about too Yeah, I, I think Zoe's going to post a link to the peer review working group that we've got I know Karen is a member of that probably a good number of you on this call might be uh, at Rebus, but we're trying to get a group together um, to think about how do we how can we make this again a, a standardized clear process for best practices at least and where the places where review happens is there you know subject matter peer review versus sort of open student review different kinds of approaches so we're just trying to um, flesh out what might be a good approach to that and, and maybe some tools and mechanisms to make that happen so uh, as I say the link should be in the chat shortly and we'll, we'll when we follow up with this we'll provide uh, some links as well to to the things we've talked about um there's a question here from uh jenny h uh asking about extra resources as part of publication so powerpoints quiz questions case studies i wonder i think i'll um, pass that one over to anthony um and maybe you can talk about what you guys have been doing with the oer commons um if you're on top sure. of that <laughs> yeah, um, glad to. So um, with most of our, our textbooks, we publish a, a light um, series of ancillaries uh, with the book. So if it's a mathematically oriented textbook, um, we'll have a student solutions manual and an instructor solutions manual, as well as PowerPoints um, or something like that, uh, test banks if, if necessary and if, and if we're able to. So we always, we always put out something. But, um, you know, due to two facts, one is that um, many instructors, many faculty don't find sort of the, I don't know, the provided, even, even from, you know, a mainstream publisher, the provided ancillaries to be the best quality 
Um, and also because uh, many instructors want to, you know, contribute uh, in, a, in a big way to this to this effort, um, we've worked with OER Commons um, to create uh, a textbook hub for each topical area. And uh, they already have organized, um, basically, subject area, um, you can call them hubs. And um, with the ones that correspond to our textbooks, it's, it's right on the course. So not just all of astronomy, but introductory astronomy for the, the typical audience. It's that targeted in this case. And we do, um, and we solicit contributions. We've gotten a lot of great contributions from faculty. Um, and there's, there's things, you know, we, we try to keep it um, faculty centered. And so we uh, verify at some level the, um, the, the people who have registered so that they can, um, you know, so they can be confident posting things like assessments and so on. Um, it's, it's a good environment for the contributions. And we do uh, co-promotions together. So we'll do, um, you know, OER, Commons, uh, you know, webinars and other events and things like that uh, because we feel that there's a number of faculty who are probably looking for this both to look for resources and to contribute. And I think from what I see on the chat here, this idea of you know how do we know who's working on what is is sort of a common thing, um, and and that this is another area I, you know that 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 uh, we're seeing great contributions. In. So there's a question here from Katya, um, which is uh, I don't know I think it's just education students, but in general, um, can someone talk a little bit about the the sort of training and education we need? Oh, I see what education students need to receive in the area of copyright and editing to ensure they understand the implications of contributing towards an open publication. Um, and, and it's, you know, this notion that if students are doing something like that, it needs to be an educated choice and they need to understand what they're contributing to and what the implications are. Does anyone who's had um, worked with students in some of their books have, have comments on, on that piece of, of that educated choice around what it means to contribute to an open publication? Um, I'll just say it's a little bit tricky, um, especially when you have students who will be earning course credit for contributing um, and for students that may not understand copyright and intellectual property and how that affects, you know, if they're building on something that's already openly licensed, um, how that'll affect everything downstream. Um, yeah, it's, it's tricky. I know um, many of you know uh, Robin DeRosa um, and she had students put together um, a, a textbook for early American, an anthology of early American literature, I believe. Um, and that was actually former students who had, um, you know, after the course was over, over summer, she, she paid them um, a reasonable fee to, you know, sort of a bounty on pieces that she needed to include in the text. Um, but I will say that it is kind of tricky um, when it's for course credit or when it's students that are in a course. And um, not that we've had very many of them question, you know, why am I giving this away? I'm supposed to be learning here, not, not building things. But that's sort of a shift that's happening anyway in terms of students, um, learners as co-creators and collaborators, um, not just as consumers of content. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Liz can pop in. We, we've actually been working on developing a guide for working with students who are part of the creation process in open content, which is essentially case studies with people who've been doing that. Um, uh, maybe someone might uh, post a link to that, or Liz, if you could pop in to talk about it, but it's certainly something we've, uh, especially with Robin DeRosa, um, her input, we've, our, I think is really exciting, but I think the ethical implications are important, so we need to be very cautious with that. Yes, so I've just posted a link here uh, to that project, and yes, this is an issue that we want to be sure to cover in uh, the guide to making open textbooks with students. We have a variety of contributors still looking for a few more. Uh, you can read the project post to find out more. Um, okay, so Katya is asking about peer reviewing guidelines. So there's a couple of other links here. I would encourage anyone who's interested in peer review, um, if you feel like joining a working group, as exciting as that sounds, we are trying to get as much feedback as we can and input into into thinking about peer review in the links here in the uh, peer review for open textbooks working group from Rebus. Um, okay. And let's see. Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. Everyone's agreeing. Sorry. I'm just reading through here. Looks like I'm at the end. Goodness. We got to the, is this the end of the internet? Um, so anyway, does anyone have more questions? Um, 
it's it's ten to four here. Um, so I'd encourage. So, so I think that's it. Does it, anyone else have any questions, comments? Uh, open it up to the floor, just to if anyone has anything to say. Uh, okay, so I, I guess I'll, I'll close it off. I'll, I'll let uh, Karen do the final closing off. Um, but uh, we will be posting this as a video. Um, we'll try to collect out these resources as well as a blog post. Um, I would like to make hearty thanks to all the people who uh, are guest speakers and all of you who joined on board. Um, I would encourage any of you, uh, if I can do a shameless plug, to join the uh, Rebus Forum at forum.rebus.community. That's kind of a place, if you do that, then it makes it easier for us to um, uh, reach out and find you when we're doing things. As I say, we're trying to build out a lot of these tools to help support a lot of the things we've talked about today. Um, and we can only do that well if we're working with great people who've got experience. So that's what we're trying to do. So I'll hand it over. Just a big thank you to all, all of you. This has been really interesting, and I think I learned a lot. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Karen to do the final um, sign-offs. Thank you, Hugh. I will echo your gratitude for all of the panelists who joined us today to share their experience and to thank everyone for their very thoughtful questions. I will also participate in the shameless plug for the Open Textbook Network. If you're not yet a member or thinking about becoming a member, um, we would love to talk to you more about that. Um, as I mentioned, several people today are indeed members. I also included a link. Um, I mentioned the Open Authoring Guide, the Editing Guide, um, which were made on Rebus. Um, so there's sort of a one-stop shop where you can see different resources in the Open Textbook world. Um, if you don't see the chat, uh, you can reach it through open.umn.edu. So thanks again. I know that um, Liz and the team there will make this video available if I'm not mistaken. Indeed we will. Look at that, we got through it all. It was uh, really awesome. So thank you everybody. Thanks and again. Let's uh, continue the conversations going forward. Thanks a lot.